So uh, our research interests lie uh, largely in the field of asymmetric catalysis where we aim to develop powerful synthetic methodologies which are founded on new, new reactivity which can be applied directly um, as key carbon-carbon bond forming events in complex target synthesis whether that be drug molecules or natural products. And we don't really mind what drives the projects in the group whether it be the methodology, the reactivity or the target but what is important is that the chemistry that we ulti ultimately develop has a practical flavor to it. So we like the reactions to be um, easy to perform, broad in scope, efficient, selective, uh, scalable, and a few other qualities as well. Because if it has those qualities, it means that it's going to be very good for that complex target synthesis, and it's going to be good for solving problems maybe in other labs as well. So um, what I'm going to do today is, is, is give you a, an overview of, uh, of the work going on in our group. It started in about 2005, what I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to show you how a reaction that we discovered from a bifunctional organocatalyst turns out to be a key reaction uh, for a complex target synthesis. And I'm going to deviate right through that synthesis. And after about 20 minutes, I'm going to come back out of the synthesis and talk about some new methods that we're currently developing in our group in Oxford. So, so one area that we've enjoyed a reasonable amount of success in is in this field of enantioselective bifunctional organocatalysis. And that's where a small organic molecule which possesses a, a basic group linked to a hydrogen bond donor group catalyzes the union of pronucleophiles. So these are carbon acids or heteroatom centered acids with reactive electrophiles like Michael acceptors, aldehydes and imines uh, going to uh, products which typically have one stereogenic center, sometimes up to three stereogenic centers, through a very organized transition structure where there's acid base activation of the pronucleophile, and on bond formation here, uh, stabilization of developing negative charge through hydrogen bonding interactions. Now, the canopy that links the base to the hydrogen bond donor can be chiral, and this can give rise to a very effective chiral pocket which organizes uh, both of these components, and this can produce very high levels of control in this product. And so uh, our contribution to the field, actually, I mean, we are not the first, but our contribution to the field came in the form of the design of this catalyst that you see in the top of the, the slide. Uh, this, is, this is based on a cinchona alkaloid, and what you see is the important thing is this, this, the bond that links this this, the carbon here to the nitrogen. So we int introduced this, and it gives us a handle to which we can attach lots of electron withdrawing groups, and that would uh, ultimately allow us to tune the hydrogen bond donor capability of, of this proton. So the idea is that this bridgehead nitrogen, which is very basic, and this hydrogen bond donor, which can be tuned, would hopefully activate various pronucleophiles, electrophiles, and, and hopefully going through an ex you know, a very organized transition structure, give rise to products with high enantiocontrol. control. And we were well aware that we could choose which pseudo enantiomer of this catalyst we could start with, and that ultimately would dictate which enantiomer of the product that we would make at the end. Okay, so the reality was fairly simple. Cinchonine grows on trees. Uh, you can also buy it from Aldrich. Uh, you can install uh, azide at this position here using Mitsunobu conditions and then reduce down the azide to the amine and the triple HCl salt of these compounds are crystalline. And you can make those in about a day on large scale. And in couple to various electrophiles like acid chlorides, isothiocyanates or sulfonyl chlorides. And what you get are a series or a little small library of, of, of structures which we hoped were, were catalysts. And at the beginning, we didn't even know if they were catalysts for anything. Um, this was the idea. And then we went looking for their, their reactivities. And to cut a long story short, or well, actually not, not a long story short, a, a medium story short, it turns out that the addition of malonate to nitrostyrene is very nicely catalyzed by the second catalyst that we found in that series, and it gives these Michael adducts here with pretty high levels of enantiocontrol. control. So the column on the right 
uh, the, is the column of enantiomeric excess, and typically they're above 90%, which is a practical level, the highest one about 97, and there's a broad scope of uh, substituents that can be tolerated in the, in the back of the nitrolefin. So it turns out to be a very applicable, uh, broadly applicable catalyst. At the bottom here, uh, just to show a bit of respect to, to our competitors, so it, it turns out there are at least four groups working on the same catalyst or type of catalyst at the same time. Uh, us, Chen, Source, and Conan, and there may be one more actually as well, but it just shows you very quickly that it became quite hot in the field of bifunctional organic catalysis, and I should say that maybe this catalyst has been used about by about 30 groups since its birth. Okay, and the origins of enantiocontrol control uh, and stereo control have been modeled by the group of Imre Papai in Hungary. Uh, that's on the, a, a diff, slightly different catalyst to this one on a slightly different reaction. But what I'm going to do is superimpose their data points onto our reaction to give you an idea of where the control comes from. So the first thing is malonate, dimethyl malonate, does not have a nucleophilic form. It has to be deprotonated by the catalyst. So this is the equilibrium here. And when you've got the enolate, this is now ready to attack the nitrolefin. Now in their studies, they had two energetically reasonable transition structures which gave rise to the same facial selectivity. Just, just for simplicity, I'm going to take us just, just through one of them to explain where the origins of control come from. So <clears throat> the, the, imagine this is starting to bond with the carbon here on the nitrolefin. What we have is a dotted line here. Uh, electrons are flowing from the red to the blue, and the nitronate is starting to develop. Now, that will be stabilized by hydrogen bonding interactions here, and the, the ammonium salt is stabilizing the, the malonate anion. This is a benefit. This is a good thing. Uh, at the carbon-carbon at the bond forming position here, these groups are in a staggered arrangement, and that's also beneficial. If you turn over the nitroolefin and expose the other face to the nucleophile, you either lose the hydrogen bond network or you go to a more eclipsed interaction here, and that costs you a couple of kilocals, and that slows down the production of the minor enantiomer. Okay, so we started over here uh, and very quickly started looking at various pronucleophiles. So we looked at dioxalanones in reactions with nitroolefins, and this turned out to be quite good. EE is 88%. We then looked at succinamides as, as pronucleophiles, and although we published this reasonably recently, this was very early on, it turns out that was a very powerful reaction. And I just want to take you quickly through that that reaction itself and then show you the link to the natural products that we've made. So <clears throat> these are relatively simple to make. They're very acidic and the, pro -nu uh, and the enolate is actually quite nucleophilic relative to other pronucleophiles. What that means is you can drop the level of, of organocatalyst loading to one mole percent, which is quite attractive, and just run these reactions at minus 20 for about five days and you get two products, two diastereomers, in a three to one ratio. And when you analyze the mixture you notice that both diastereomers are formed with high enantiomeric excess, which tells you that in both of the transition structures you can, that the catalyst can, if you like, stabilize one of the enantiomeric uh, structures over the other uh, very nicely. And what you also see is that these are diastereomeric at the quaternary center, not the tertiary center. So the catalyst, if you like, is delivering uh, the nucleophile um, to just one face of the, of the, of the nitrolefin. Okay, that aside, we were fairly confident that this product type must be a structural element in natural products. What we have is a quat center, we have a tertiary center, we have an aromatic ring, we have a lot, lots of functionality in there. We were convinced that this was uh, going to be a, a, a reaction which we could exploit in synthesis. And we went looking for natural products and uh, the, the journey went something like this. So this is a structure that we knew we could make. If you, if you change the, the color scheme on that, okay, that doesn't really help you, right? But when I do this, does that help? Not really, but it's the same compound, look. And then when you just do one more transformation, you see the link to that beautiful natural product. Do you see that? Look at that, beautiful, beautiful. So all we've got to do is uh, attach a few carbons and, and take away a few carbons and we're, we're sorted. So that was, the, uh, that was the, the beginning of a fairly large project. So this is called Nacodemar RNA. It belongs to a, a, a large family of uh, natural products called the manzamines and it has this beautiful 855655 uh, 15 ring system 
uh, and it's got reasonably good biology. So it, it kills bad cells and it inhibits CDK4, which apparently is important, and it's got some antifungal and antibacterial properties. Uh, and it's one of those compounds that attracted lots of synthetic attention. So before we even started, there were about seven papers describing roots to the core. Uh, there were two papers from the same group, Nishida's group actually, describing two separate journeys to the same compound, one the unnatural and one the natural. And during the journey I'm going to tell you about, uh, my friend uh, Mike Kerr published a 29-step route. Now, you could argue there's no need for any more routes. There's already three here. Um, you know, why are you joining the party? Well, the, the, the fact was, if you look at the step count on there, it's pretty high, actually. The average is around 33. And we figured that we could really push down that step count by introducing this new catalyst-enabled reaction and inventing some cascades on the way. Uh, yeah, so the way we go about uh, synthesis projects is to combine as many catalyst-enabled synthetic methods with as many cascade sequences as we can from appropriately chosen starting materials. And the idea is that by bringing these together using these methods, we can bypass unnecessary intermediates and get very quickly to late-stage intermediate E. I mean, obviously, this is just abstract, but the, the point is, we can do this rapidly and on scale, and therefore we can have gram quantities of this. Now, that's a good place to be because you're going to have enough material to solve the steps getting to the natural product from an academic point of view. If you're lucky, this intermediate will have bioactivity, and you get into analogs that you would never get from the natural product itself because these will be synthetic. And if you wanted to, you could take your material at the end and turn that into natural product analogs. So we aim for about 15 steps in a typical synthesis, uh, but of course we will take 12 and we will take 8 if necessary. And so <clears throat> I'm going to demonstrate to you or, or describe to you route two, not route one or route three or route four, just route two. Route two was a special one um, <clears throat> and basically we knew that we needed to make the big ring here using ring closing metathesis chemistry and that would come back to this alkene and this alkene and we needed to bring these ends together with Z selectivity. Right? There was a problem in Nishida's route and in Kerr's route of getting a predominance for the E isomer, not the Z isomer, using ring closing metathesis. And it was a problem we knew we had to solve at the end of the synthesis. And we initially just hoped to get lucky on that. Um, going back, uh, there's various disconnections here, but it opens up to what is a pronucleophile adding into a nitroolefin, and we knew we could catalyze that reaction. And then we hoped we could do a manic, a nitromanic reaction to introduce one more carbon, and then cyclize to make the A ring here, and a, little, a, li a few other transformations in as well. I'll, I'll show you those as we go through. <coughs> so <clears throat> a key player was the 8-5 ring system. And to make that, we take this tosylate of pyroglutamol. Uh, we substitute this position here with this uh, this thiolate of a, of a tetrazole, it gives you this sulfide. We can then alkylate on nitrogen with this bromoacetal, simple chemistry to bring in the carbons. We can oxidize the sulfide to the sulfone using MCPBA and hydrolyze the acetal with just dilute acid to give the aldehyde. Now that was done on a large scale. For us, large scale is like 50 grams. Um, and then in five batches of 10 grams, we went through this Julia Kaczynski reaction here, which was unprecedented for making the eight ring uh, in such a strained bicyclic system. But it went beautifully to give this compound without racemization. Uh, standard 56% yield was attained every time. And then we could acylate this position here using carbonate and, and lithium uh, LHMDS, a strong base. So this gave us plenty of this material here. The, the uh, nitroolefin is made uh, from a combination of literature methods from uh, Greco, uh, De Maier, and Maldonado. So you take these ketophosphonates, you doubly deprotonate, and you gamma alkylate with allyl bromide. It makes you this anionic ketophosphonate, which then can undergo Wadsworth Horner Emmons with this dihydroxyacetone equivalent, and it gives this enone here on large scale. And when you hydrolyze that with dilute acid, it cyclizes to the furan very nicely indeed, and you get this hydroxymethyl group here, which is what we wanted. Swern oxidation followed by a, a condens condensation with nitromethane gave us the nitroolefin in 88% in yield. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we made this and we made this, and when you mix them together, nothing happens, right? They, these, these need to be facilitated by some kind of base. The base in, in our system was going to be the catalyst, this is our, our uh, it's the ure urea version of one of our catalysts. And it turns out you mix these two together 
Uh, this brings these together beautifully, but very slowly. That's not a typographical error. That is 9D for days at 30 degrees C. It's a very slow but very smooth reaction, and you can isolate a good yield, 57% of a 10 to 1 mixture of diastereomers. And it has the right stereochemistry between these, these two carbons here, which is exactly what we are looking for.